little book with a big message. That's how our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, describes the Old Testament book of Esther. And that's where the Bible bus begins on the Sunday sermon with Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard as we depart for another great adventure in God's Word. Our message is called The Strange Providences of God. So while you grab your copy of God's Word and find your seat on the Bible bus, we've got just enough time to share a few letters from our fellow listeners These are in Southeast Asia. The first letter is from a pastor who lives in Vietnam. I'm a pastor of an illegal gathering of believers. The government would shut us down if they knew we existed. We have been using the speaker box and the SD chips that you provide to help our people know God's word. They listen during the week in their homes or in the fields where they work. Your program is very helpful to me as well, because as we study the Bible book by book, it has come alive for our congregation. Recently, I have been traveling to other churches to preach as well. Your program helps because when I cannot be with one, they have a teacher in your messages, and we have a large group of believers going through the gospel at the same pace. We all praise the Lord for your ministry and for the hunger that you have given us for the word. Next, we hear from a listener in Myanmar who listens to our Burmese broadcast. I listen to Burmese through the Bible very often. Whenever I have the opportunity, your messages are on. Your teaching is very precious. I've come to know the meaning of scripture verses, which were before hazy to me. In addition to learning more about God, I enjoy the biographies and biblical characters and the history I now understand. With each broadcast, I've come to trust God more and confide in him more. I am now very fond of every book of the Bible, every chapter and every verse of God's word because of your good teaching. I am unable to choose a favorite or tell you which book has strengthened me most. Pray for my family that we will resist Satan's temptation and find victory in Christ. My children are abroad and out of reach, but I trust God to keep them in his sights, and I pray that they will continue to follow him in all that they do. And then our final note is from a listener of our Indonesian broadcast. She writes, Each time I hear God's word, I feel that he is blessing me. I often feel hopeless. I am sick and have been housebound for six long years. Although I cannot go out and see God's creation and meet with friends, I feel God's amazing love when I listen to your words. I believe that God always listens to my prayers. Thank you for helping me to remain strong and to live in peace with my family. Please pray that God will cure me. Well, our world prayer team is traveling through Southeast Asia this week. So if you'd like to join us as we travel on our knees praying for these listeners and millions of others, then why don't you sign up today? Go to ttb.org forward slash pray and do it today. Now let's pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that reminds us of your providence in our lives and in the world. Thank you for all the good in our lives and all the bad, and that you would use both to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our subject this morning is the strange providences of God. We begin a series of messages in the little book of Esther, and this little book has a big message. The message is the providence of God. Now, providence is a theological term. Dr. Strong, in his ponderous tome, defines it like this. Providence is that continuous agency of God by which he makes all events of the physical and moral universe fulfill the original design with which he created it. And I'm sure somebody is saying, well, can't you reduce that to the lowest common denominator for the layman on the street? Well, there are three words that describe the three acts and the works of God in relationship 
to his physical universe. There is, first of all, creation, and that explains the existence of the universe. By his fiat word, he created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there are only two alternatives today. Either you accept revelation or speculation. There's not but two explanations. And regardless of what you say, evolution is speculation. There is no scientific explanation for the origin of the universe. You have to speculate. Therefore, I do not know about you, but I accept revelation. And that explains the origin of the universe. The second word is preservation, and that explains its continuance. In other words, God not only created it, but he holds it together. It would come unglued today if it were not for him. The Lord Jesus is the one who is the creator. He's also the preserver. We're told in Hebrews, the third chapter, our first chapter, I should say, third verse, upholding all things by the word of his power, holding them together. And then Paul in Colossians 1.17 says, and by him all things consist, the consistency of the universe. It would all come unglued today if he were not holding it together. And then the third word is the word we're looking at today, providence, and that explains the progress and development of this universe. Creation explains the origin, and preservation explains its continuance, but providence explains the progress and development. And again, providence is the means by which God directs all things, both animate and inanimate, seen and unseen, good and evil, toward a worthy purpose, which means his will must finally prevail. And the Word of God teaches that. For instance, you have in Psalm 103, 19, his kingdom ruleth over all. And then in Psalm 135, listen to this, Whatsoever the Lord please, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, in all deep places. Now, God is running this universe to please himself, not you or me. We are creatures. He's the creator, and we ought to get that straight, by the way, in our thinking. The only freedom of speech that you and I have is that which he gives us. He is the creator. We are a creature. He goes on and says, He he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasures, who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast, who sent signs and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his servants, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. God takes the responsibility for doing those things. And Daniel, in the fourth chapter, expresses it like this, in the 35th verse, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? In other words, God does not have to make a report to anyone concerning his conduct. God is running this universe, and he runs it by his providential dealings, if you please. Paul in Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 11, expresses it thus, Who worketh all things after the counsel of of his own will. Now, somebody says, but you're still theological. Well, how about this? God is at the steering wheel of this universe. Providence is the way that God coaches the man that's on second base. 
Providence means that God is back of the scenes and is shifting them and directing them. Or as we have had it expressed, in the shadows standeth God keeping watch over his own. Or put it like this, the providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. And that glove will never move until he moves it. Now, the book of Esther teaches the providence of God. Actually, the name of God's not mentioned in the book of Esther. A great many have wanted to put it out of the canon of Scripture because of that. It's a revelation of the people of God out of the will of God. They're walking in a a willful pathway, and they're away from God. They'll not appeal to him. No appeal is made to him in the book of Esther. But God will overrule. He will protect. And the word providence in Scripture, the Greek word, means to provide. He will provide. It means that God is back of his creation today, back of the human race, back of those that are his own that have been redeemed, and God is directing them in the world today. Now, in the book of Esther, you have that. Esther was made queen. Actually, she was not just queen for a day. She was a queen for her lifetime. And the way she got it was by a beauty contest. We'll see that next Sunday night. Lucky, you say. Sure, that's the word. She is lucky from a human standpoint. But God was back of it. And uh, her uncle... Mordecai, he happened to overhear a plot to slay the king. And uh, he was lucky that he overheard it. Sure, he's lucky. God's overruling it. He reports that. And they didn't reward him at that time. Say, was he unlucky? They didn't recognize him at all. And then one night, the king couldn't sleep. And he couldn't get it his aspirin bottle, and therefore he wasn't able to get to sleep. And they, he called for the archives of the kingdom. That was the minutes of the kingdom. And believe me, minutes are boring. I don't care whose they are. And these minutes were boring. They had a few little exciting things in it, like a few murders and that type of thing. But... Uh, They were read to him. And I want to say that when nothing else had put the king to sleep, reading those minutes had put him to sleep. And uh, so he was alerted, though, because they read in that particular place what what Mordecai did, but he wasn't rewarded. And the king asked the question. And he said, well, he wasn't rewarded. And uh, he said, well, we're going to reward him. And do you know that it just came at the psychological moment? Sounds like luck. It was luck on a human plane, but God is overruling that. And God saved an entire people from being exterminated just because of that. Now, providence is actually not confined to the book of Esther. You find it running as a bright thread all the way through the Word of God. You can go back to Joseph. We have had occasion to refer to him, especially in our Through the Bible program. This man, Joseph, is without doubt the, he is the champion hard luck boy. No one seemed to have had it as bad as he had it. This young fellow, 17 years of age, favorite of his father, given a coat of many colors, my, he would have had a wonderful advantage at home, but his brothers plotted against him actually wanted to murder him. But even worse than that, they sold him into slavery. He's carried down the land of Egypt. Now, I want to tell you, for a 17-year-old boy, that's terrible. But, you know, he, uh, he recognized the hand of God in his life. And he began to advance, for he was sold down in Egypt to an official. And just as he got to the top, his, the rug is pulled out from under him. And he finds himself thrown into prison. And I want to tell you, that's time to give up. But he didn't. He interpreted a dream of Pharaoh's baker and butler. 
And he said to the butler when he returned to Pharaoh, he said, Now, be sure and tell Pharaoh about me, because I'm down here and I'm not guilty, and I'd like to get out. And you know what happened? The butler forgot all about him. And he is down there for at least a couple of years in prison. And I want to tell you, in two years you can become very discouraged in prison when you're not guilty. But this boy, I don't know, he's riding on top of the waves all the time. The hand of God's in his life. God, by his providence, is directing him. And then one day, Pharaoh has a dream. And the butler says, I tell you, I remember my sins today. I forgot all about that boy. And there's somebody here can interpret your dream. Well, you know, it had been the worst thing in the world had the butler told Pharaoh about that uh, when he first got in. Joseph would have been back home, and he'd never been there to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. God kept him there, and Joseph saw that later in his life. For again, God preserved the people. And later on, Joseph could look back on his life and say to his brothers, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Did you know that God has even put into your life certain enemies, and he's done it for your good? Oh, today we, we begin to cry, and we go to the wailing wall and complain and whine. But actually, God permits these in our lives for a purpose. It was David Haram. You remember, he had some very... Oh, old-fashioned wisdom to dish out years ago, and one of them was this. He says, God permits a dog to have a reasonable amount of fleas, and it's a good thing, for it enables the dog to take his mind off the fact that he's a dog. Now, God permits us to have an enemy or trouble to come into our lives, so we'll turn to him. And do you know that's the only way he can get a great many people is by sending them trouble? There are people sitting here this morning. You came to God when trouble came to you, and you wouldn't have come otherwise. So God permits it. Shakespeare put it like this, There is a divinity that shapes our ends. Rough hew them how we will. And someone has put it in this lovely way, disappointment should be spelled with an H, and then it's his appointment. God permits these things to come into our lives, even disappointments and enemies and even tragedies. And he does it for a purpose. There's another book in the Bible that doesn't teach that. It's the Romance of Redemption. But in it, you see the providential dealings of God. One morning, Ruth went out of Bethlehem, went down to find a field to glean in. She knew nothing about Bethlehem. I walked down that road, did it purposely, and I looked on every side. I'll be honest with you, what field would you pick? Well, it's going to be very important what field she goes in, because if she doesn't go into the right field then you can send word to the wise men not to arrive. They didn't arrive at Christmas. Better get word to them not to come. Jesus will not be born in Bethlehem. But you see, she's going in the right field, and we're told her hap was to light on a field belonging to Boaz. For her it was happenstance. But God by his providence was directing. The writer to the Proverbs says this very resting thing in the 16th chapter, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing there is of, Je- is of Jehovah. God says you can't even go to Las Vegas and throw the dice without he's not there, seeing how they come up. The hap is cast into the lap. And the Greeks had a saying like this. The dice of the gods are loaded. God says to you and me, don't gamble with me, I'll win. I know how it's coming up. You don't. So don't gamble with me. Oh, how many people gamble with their lives today? My friend, you don't gamble with God. She looked to God, Ruth did. I know she prayed. 
and she was willing to look to him, but God never revealed it to her. He led her by his providence, as he'll lead any willing soul today. And one of the most interesting cases is concerning old Ahab. And as a man far from God, and this man, he went in partnership with Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat should not have done it. And they were going against the Syrians. And Ahab pulled a good one. He dressed up like a common soldier. And the only king that went into the battle dressed like a king was Jehoshaphat, and he almost got killed because they took out out the king. They're looking for the top, bar- top man, you know. And Ahab, he's chuckling. <laughs> he said, they won't get me for the very simple reason that I'm very well protected. I wear the... I wear a a uniform of a common soldier, and the battle is over, and I think he wiped his brow, and he said, I made it. (laughs) But he didn't make it because there happened to be on the other side a trigger-happy soldier. And we're told in 1 Kings 22, 34, and a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of his harness, wherefore he said unto the driver of the chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And he was wounded unto death. You see, that arrow had Ahab's name on it. And that trigger happy soldier... He had shot all of his arrows, and he happened to look back in the quiver, and there's one that's there. And he says, my gracious, the battle is over, and i still got an arrow left. What'll I do? He put it in his bow, he pulled it back, and he let it go, and he wasn't aiming at anything. little boy that got a BB gun for Christmas is ass when he shot. He said, uh, a friend said to him, what did you hit? He said, nothing. Well, he said, what did you shoot at? He said, nothing. May I say to you, friend, this soldier shot at nothing, but he hit Ahab. And he was killed because God had said through Micaiah the prophet that that was what would happen to him. May I say to you, by the providence of God, Caesar Augustus signed the tax bill. And if you'd leaned over his shoulder and said, that's interesting, that will cause a prophecy given by by Micaiah and Micah 700 years ago to be fulfilled, he'd have laughed and said, I know nothing about that, I need taxes. We need an army. And we need to carry on the poverty program here in Rome. And that's what he was carrying on. And so he increased taxes. May I say to you that uh, it moved Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And the psalmist in Psalm 22, 28 says, He is the ruler over the nations. Yes, he is. And he still is. A young man one day was arrested. His name was Stephen. Verdict was handed in. He was to be stoned to death, and they stoned him to death. And we're told that at that time, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. When that young man looked up and says, I see heaven open and Jesus standing, they all cried out, it's blasphemy. And Saul of Tarsus, a brilliant young Pharisee there, the biggest skeptic of all, he said, it's ridiculous. 
And he led the group. They put their clothes at his feet, and he directed the stoning of Stephen. And after he looked down at that bloody mass of that boy lying there, he looked into the heaven in cynicism and skepticism and said, he had something I don't have. Oh, if I only could see Jesus. And a few days later, on the way to Damascus, he was prepared for what happened. For again, there was a light above the brightness of the sun. May I say to you, God, by his providential dealings, used Stephen's, and he being dead was speaking to Saul of Tarsus. My friend, providences are not confined to the Bible. They're evident in secular history. All you have to do is open your eyes. God stopped Xerxes. God had said through Daniel that he was going to move the power where it would, had been from the beginning out of the east of Asia and Africa to Europe. And he did. He did it when Xerxes came to Thermopylae. And he lost there. Why? Well, he had a superior force, but you could only put a few men in that pass, and the Greeks had superior soldiers. And also, the Greeks were masters on the ocean, but they could not match the 300 vessels of Xerxes. But God could. And that, again, going by that Bay of Salamis, we stopped. And I have several pictures I took there. And as I looked out as it is today, a modern, it's a very modern poet, but that's the place where a storm destroyed 300 vessels of Xerxes and shifted the power from the east to the west and changed the entire destiny of the world. May I say God moves in the affairs of men. Napoleon said God is on the side of the, of the biggest battalions. But he was wrong because he had the biggest battalions at Waterloo, but he lost. The Spanish Armada was anchored off the coast of England. The next day, England would have gone down in defeat, but that night a storm came, and when the morning light came, the Spanish Armada was wrecked. Great Britain became the proud leader of the seas that she held for 300 years, and the destiny of the world was changed. Did you know the hand of God has been in our own nation? You can't read our history without recognizing God has moved in the history of this nation. When Columbus was coming to this country the first time, to the Western Hemisphere, he was headed directly to either the coast of Virginia or the Carolinas. And a flight of pigeons went by to the West Indies, and he followed them. And the Spanish flag went up on South America and the West Indies, and Protestantism came to this country. Why, South America has more natural resources than North America has ever had. But it's lagged, and the story is told in religion. May I say to you, God was directing the affairs of the world. During the Revolutionary War, Benedict Arnold betrayed his country. He gave the entire blueprint of West Point to Major Andre. Major Andre was riding toward White Plains, New York. Major Andre of the British forces. He had those plans, those blueprints in his boot. He came to a crossroads. He did not know which one to take, but God knew. And down the road he took, there were revolutionary soldiers. And he made the big mistake of saying the wrong thing, or they never would have searched him. And they did. And they discovered the awful betrayal, and the country was saved. May I say to you, even then the colonists stayed too close to the eastern seaboard, they dared not penetrate even the, those deep forests of the Middle West. And then God started a gold rush to California. Just waved a little gold. 
And a lot of people came to California. They didn't get gold, but they came to California, and they've been coming ever since. We should stop now. The freeways are failed. May I say to you that, uh, that someone has said that it's a good thing that America was settled from the East Coast. If they'd come first to the West Coast, the East Coast still wouldn't be settled. And that's probably true. But may I say to you, that's the way that God moved. Now, somebody says, yes, God guides nations. I can see that. But what about the individual today? What about the man who's turned his back on God? Is there any hope for him? It sure is. That's the man I'm interested in. There's a very interesting statement made, and it's found over. I think I've got it marked here somewhere. In the 42nd chapter of the, that very wonderful chapter of Isaiah, and it's the 16th verse. Will you listen to this? After presenting my servant who is none other than the Lord Jesus, and then talking about that nation, now listen to what he says, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they've not known. I'll make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. That's what God said. May I be personal? I can bring this right down to the church of the open door. The first time I preached in this church was at a Sunday night service when I came out here as a tourist, and apparently very few people knew that there was a famous preacher from a little town in Texas that was preaching here, because there weren't many people here that evening. And uh, I preached best I could, and there was a lady sitting, she's sitting right down in that area right there. And she was a very distinguished-looking lady. When we gave an invitation to accept Christ, she put up her hand. Many of you will remember Ms. Redmond. Ms. Redmond dealt with her. And the next day when I came in, Ms. Redmond told me her story. This woman had come out here from the east, the Chicago area, some place near Chicago. And... Uh, I'm not quite clear just her mission, but either a daughter or a son had come out here and she'd lost track of him and she came out to locate them. She had either been unsuccessful in locating them or else the one that she was after absolutely turned their back upon the mother. The mother went down to the station, the railroad station. She had about five hours to wait for a train. And naturally, she was terribly disturbed in her own mind and heart. She began to walk, and she walked up into this area, and the chimes of the church were played. Apparently, she was out on Fifth Street because she couldn't find a way in here to the church. And she walked around several blocks and finally came in that night, and she sat down there. Miss Redmond told me that she had letters from that woman after that of how it was the turning point in her life. She said, I came in there that night with the idea even of suicide because I thought everything had gone black for me. And she said, it was the greatest moment of my life. You know why she was here? By the providence of God. And since then... One Easter Sunday, a Methodist layman came in here. It was Easter. <laughs> he went to church on Easter, so he came. But he got saved that day. Why did he come in here? Because of the providence of God. A doctor was attending just a few years ago now, a medical convention over here at the Statler Hotel. And... Uh, he apparently, from what he told me, he had a pretty rough Saturday night. He's far from God. 
He got up in the morning and he looked out his window and he saw the sign says, Jesus saves. And he came here to church that morning. He said to me later when he told me about it, he said, I knew the message was for me from the beginning, but he said, when you gave the invitation, not a hand went up. And he said, I knew right there that you'd preach that one for me. He said, I went back to my room and got down on my knees. We're on the radio station in Yakima, Washington, because of that doctor. You know why he came here? Because of the providence of God. You know, I'd quit preaching if it wasn't for the providence of God. That's the thing that makes life thrilling and exciting. I do not know what this year will be. Frankly, I hope it's going to be better than last year was. But I want to say this to you. It's going to be thrilling and exciting. I do not know what's around the corner, and you don't either. But God, by his providence, is leading. Oh, this world right now, where today the philosophy that's taught in the majority of our colleges is the philosophy of aimlessness of life, purposelessness of life, meaninglessness of life. Why, my friend, today, by God, by his providence, he had you in mind millions of years ago, and today he wants to direct you. Why don't you let him? And you are here today, either in this auditorium, or you are out yonder listening by radio because God has arranged it. That's the reason. And you may need him today. You may need a Savior. Why, every day is a new adventure for a child of God. He brings into our lives, yes, enemies, trouble, but he also brings into our lives that of sweetness and of love and of friends and blessings and light and life. He's the one that's doing that today, and he wants to bring it into your life. Abraham took his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, there in the walls of Jerusalem. Today is where it is. He built the altar, he arranged the wood, a fire was ready, and his son Isaac said, Dad, there's the altar, and the wood, and the fire, but where is the lamb? Will you listen? Abraham said, God will provide. That's my word. Providence means provide. God will provide himself a lamb. Now, don't get mixed up with that ram that got caught in the bush. That's a ram. That's not the lamb. Nineteen hundred years later, he walked into Jerusalem, and he walked into that area where Abraham had offered Isaac. And Abraham and Isaac looked around, and there was no lamb. There was a ram caught in a thicket. Nineteen hundred years later, a man walked into that area, and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God has provided a lamb for you, friends. I don't know what your need is today, but you need, I know this, you need the lamb of God to take away your sin. You need him today, and he can help you, and he can save you. May I conclude with this story? The oil fields of East Texas were probably the last rough and tumble oil fields that this country has had. In that area, there was one of those dirt farmers, a man who was very shrewd, uncanny, but uneducated, and oil was discovered on his land. He was sharp enough not to sell. 
He began actually his own refinery and independent work. He became immensely wealthy. He built a lovely home, a beautiful home. And uh, he had a wife, a lovely wife. And he had two boys, little fellas. And this man was as godless, he was as wicked, he was as vile, he was profane as any man that's ever walked this earth. The flu epidemic hit East Texas. His wife and one of the little boys died. I had two friends that were pastors in that area. Both of them had told me the story. One of these men who lived, his church was nearby, he went to see him that evening. He went in this, this lovely big home, and there were the two caskets. And there sat the man. He went over to sit down by him. He put his arm around the man to comfort him. The man shrugged him off and began to curse him. He told me, he said, I've never heard language like that. He said, he cursed me as I've never been cursed before, and he cursed God. He said, what right has God to take my wife and my little boy? Time went on, a few, few short years. Then one early one morning, when I went to the broadcast station in Dallas, the news commentator right ahead of me announced that they had had an explosion at the New London School in East Texas. There were 500 children and teachers that were killed. It was one of the greatest tragedies this country has had. That man knew his little boy was at the school. He rushed over. He didn't see him anywhere, and he began to dig like a madman in that debris and rubble. And finally, someone called him. And the little boy was there, dead. This man took him up in his arms and walked up and down the school yard like a madman. And then they took him home. The little boy was put in the casket. And again, my friend knew he had to go through the ordeal. He knocked on the door. He was ushered in, and there was now just one little white casket. And there sat this father all huddled over crushed and broken. And he steeled himself for what he was sure would come, and he went over. He didn't dare put his arm on him, around him this time, or even touch him. And he said, I've come to comfort you the best I can. The man looked up, tears coursing down his cheeks, and he said, he said, you know, I've known all along God was after me, but I didn't know he'd have to do this. To get me. And that man came to Christ. He'll do it. By his providence today, he moves into lives. Oh, my friend, he wants to move into your life. He has provided a lamb to save you. What does God need to do to bring you into a relationship with him? Well, it's our prayer that the opportunity that you've had to hear this program will be enough. To find out more about God's provision of a Savior, visit us at ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find several of Dr. McGee's resources that we've set aside just for you. Or if you'd like to receive a couple of these resources by mail, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and leave a message. To hear more from Dr. McGee on the strange and wonderful providences of God, join us for the daily program of Through the Bible. Now, our study in the book of Esther is just beginning, and we'd sure love to have you hop aboard the Bible bus with us each day. If you want to listen online or see if your station carries the daily program of Through the Bible, then just visit us at ttb.org. Now, until the same time next week, we pray that God will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace as you walk with him each day. Jesus came home, unto him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.